So um, I lifted a, a handful of slides from a uh, presentation that I uh, occasionally give about remote computing. Um, and um, specifically, one option out of the options for remote computing is what, what I'll be talking about um, today, and that is the Nectar Research Cloud. So, um, my name is Jus Burkhardt. I work as a data specialist at um, the Tasmanian Partnership for Advanced Computing, and we are TPAC is um, one node in a network of um, national network of data centers, providing a number of e-research infrastructure facilities, computing in another word, data storage being another one, and, uh, and a, a few services surrounding that. So um, a few services surrounding that, I'll, I'll, um, this is again, I'm, because I've lifted this from another presentation, we provide HPC services, high performance compute that is, we provide data storage services, facilitation, support, outreach, etc. And we have this cloud computing infrastructure. Um, HPC and cloud computing and to some extent some of these services um, fall into the sort of the area of remote computing. Now remote computing I often um, present as somewhat of a, a spectrum so um, and the spectrum in, indicates scale and it's not necessarily scale of the machine it's also scale of your ambitions and demands a little bit um, of course the top one over there is not particularly remote at all your laptop um, but it does indicate that we are starting at at a particular scale. Um, then in this cloud space, you see VDI, that is one of the services that we won't talk about much about today, but these 24 seven compute and collaboration compute, that is that, that cloud computing space that in our area is, um, is um, facilitated using the Nectar um, research cloud. At the bottom end of this, we jump another order of magnitude in scale, or maybe two, and we've got high performance computer. We won't talk much about that. So this little blurb, um, before you worry about um, that this is going to be a presentation, I'll be doing a demonstration more than a presentation. Um, but there's a couple of sort of introductory things here. This is a little blurb that comes from Nectar, um, Nectar themselves, and it says infrastructure, software and services, and it says remotely, and it says autonomously. It's very much a self-service model. And then there's a few words in there that, um, that um, just finish it all off and make it read well, except I don't really know what it means to run data. Um, but it is available to us and it is um, uh, efficiently available in, in this, in this self-service sort of way. So I'll demonstrate that um, in a tick. So a, a little bit um, of um, other words around that. The Nectar Research Cloud is an OpenStack cloud. OpenStack is a software platform that you don't need to worry about much at all. It is the, the software that gives us these virtual computers and these virtual computers are the remote machines that we are talking about. Um, Self-service launching is a word that we'll use a few times. That means making, a, bringing a computer into existence. Configuration is, of course, what we all do with our own computers, laptop through to, um, through to these sort of computers as well. And virtual machines. Virtual machine is the language. You'll hear me use the word instance occasionally. That's synonymous for our purpose. Virtual machine or instance. Um, then Nectar Research, of course, provides training materials that go with this um, that are available on our support website. And there is an allocation mechanism. Allocation is code. It is um, it means uh, it means free. It means that your stuff is free. Whatever you're asking from us is going to be free, provided that your request is allocated those resources. So yes, it is about free 
at the point of end use um, resources, um, but that comes with a request and a sort of an approval mechanism. Um, so the software locally that you'll need is it helps phenomenally if you're familiar with terminal software, um, but um, and it, to some extent it's required. Um, web browsers are going to be required because we'll be launching using a dashboard that is a, a web application. Um, but depending on what sort of um, instance you launch, um, you will you will use other types of software. A popular one is your web browser, really. If you were to launch an instance that serves an RStudio server, then you would access that RStudio server using your browser. I can show you later on. So that's the examples that are on this page, right? So there's this terminal in the middle. Um, I'm a Windows user, as you can see, so my screenshots tend to be Windows focused. Um, the right hand side is an RStudio indeed that runs in a Chrome browser. And the left hand side is actually, um, is actually a remote desktop that runs with a piece of open source software called X2Go. Um, anyway, let me jump forward to give you a sense of scale of this entire operation. This, this slide is indicating here that we've got 38,000 CPUs um, that are provisioned out through this uh, platform. So there are um, to the tune of 9,000 or so individual um, virtual machines that use up to 30 or that use 38,000 CPUs. So that's the scale of the operation. It's a pretty, it's a very resilient operation um, that um, your request, you don't have to be like too um, careful about, you know, asking or, or worrying about, okay, what am, what am I asking? You're asking stuff from a big and resilient pool of resources. It'd be nice if you are resource frugal, quite obviously, and modest about it and, and scale your requests to your needs, um, give them back when you're done with them. Um, but the scale of this is also something that is meant to really make you not worry about it. So um, I said national, you can see Auckland there at the top. We're actually international these days. Actually international. Um, so let me jump in to a demo. It's a little bit free form this, so please feel free to jump in and ask questions or, or point out things that are um, unclear um, to you. And then we'll, we'll um, I'm, I mean, I can talk for an hour, so we'll easily fill it. Um, but your questions will make it more relevant. So I'm going to make this smaller. I will open an incognito window so that it match closer matches closely matches your experience because of course my browser remembers all kinds of stuff about me. Okay, come on. I am navigating to an area called dashboard.rc. RC stands for research cloud um, .nectar.org.au and that is my access point to this oh, <laughs> it already knew me. I, <laughs> I want to log out, log me out. And now maybe that's because yes I already have a incognito window open. Uh, has it forgotten me? It should, right? Yes, this is much better. Okay, I navigate to dashboard.rc.nectar.org.au and it brings me to the auth authentication page. Um, any Australian researcher, and for this New Zealand, um, there's, a, there's an equivalent for the New Zealand users, but any Australian researcher is, um, is likely to be part of AAF. AAF is the Australian Access Federation. It is how all the universities and research institutions have banded together and then um, given um, authorization to, you know, to use resources. And um, because, of course, someone in Queensland may not know me in Tasmania, from a bar of soap, 
that authorization is delegated out again straight back to those membership universities that shows like this i click on australian login i search for my organization which is in my case the university of tasmania and i click that and i come to my university's identity provisioning page i'm sure which is code for i'm not sure um, that you are familiar with um, these identity provisioning pages for resources at your universities too. So um, fill in your um, university's login details. Um, you see that mine is managed by a password manager. If you're not familiar with password managers and you are not using password managers, you really should. Um, but that's beyond today and you see me coming into the Nectar dashboard. So um, step back, we are about to start, we're about to go to virtual Harvey Norman and buy ourselves a free computer. That's what we're here to do and then later in the demonstration we'll see that 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 computer and we'll be be able to log on to it and make it do stuff. Um, so um, on the left hand side there's a panel of all kinds of options the, the thing that that interests us most for this introduction is instances there's that word again instance it's the same as a virtual computer or a virtual machine um, um, that's what we will be using there's a few things that i want to draw your attention to in here what you can't see is that over here is my Okay, sorry, I need to click this thing away, but I couldn't see it because Zoom was covering it over the top. Um, there's you as a user, that's in me in this case. On the left hand side here is a project, PT stands for personal trial. I am a um, member of um, a dozen or so projects. Um, and but but for anyone not familiar with this, if you log on to um, to uh, Nectar, you will be granted a personal trial project with limited resources immediately, no questions asked. Limited resources, you can up, use up to a few um, CPUs and up to a few months for you to have a go, have a crack, and see if it works, or to run through all the training, uh, the self-paced training. Anyway, I will be using a project called TPAC Training, where I've got the resources available for our demonstration. So if you think our website is slow, just compare it to running to Harvey Norman. Um, and it still feels pretty quick when you do that. So instances um, are launched. Um, and launching means bringing them into existence. Um, I should mention here that there are two requirements for launching an instance. One is about public private keys. Um, so there's the very minimum um, minimum required for understanding and using a, a public private key pair. It's a security mechanism. I've already set that up and I'll, I'll stop short of putting that into our demonstration here. Public private key. Um, literacy is uh, is a requirement and um and it's fairly easy the ba basic use case is fairly easy but i won't um, spend much time on it here the other is that these virtual machines they uh, live in an area that's exposed to the internet so we need to be security conscious and at nectar we facilitate that by making your machine deaf and dumb to begin with it doesn't listen to anything or anyone unless we specify it to listen to what we need it to listen to. We do that using a mechanism called security groups and security groups contain a little bit of um, networking numbers called TCP ports. It's fairly straightforward. We'll see in the launch mechanism um, where that applies. I've already set up the keys. I've already set up my security groups. Uh, I think actually, um, occasionally I clean out the training area. Anyway, I'm going to leap um, to instances.
and I don't need to cross a road or you know, there's no buses to look out for here. Whereas on the way from here to Harvey Norman, there is. And here is a, a button called launch instance. It will start the launch instance dialog. This is a sort of a wizard that will take you through um, the, um, the steps and requirements it takes to um, create an instance. I'm going to call mine Acme Analysis. I'm not sure about spaces. I won't need to do an, a, a, a description. Um, availability zone. I can leave it to sit sit on any. That way, the software will decide. Um, but um, here is the here are the options. There are options that are available on a. Um, I think there's more options available to me because I've got a few roles in them. Um, so you, you might find a smaller list. I'm going to launch something in Tasmania. Um, and I'm going to launch one. All right. So what is it that I'm launch, launching? A computer. But I can launch a computer at a variety of um, with a variety of specifications. These are usually, in terms of operating software and and soft um, and um, operating soft system and, and software pre-installed, are usually uh, called images. And that's what I'll be booting or launching my system from. I'll be using a very standard um, offering of ours uh, called Ubuntu. It's a Linux flavor. It's a very popular Linux flavor. I'll take the newest one here that's called 18.04. And I use that arrow button to make it select it in the allocated space up here. And then I click next, but this is a long list, so I can also just manually jump to the next page. Flavor is open stack language for size parameters. Size parameters, as you can see, there's a few here. I'm going to just find something um, small, or I can actually find something tiny. Um, small stuff is, of course, fewer resources. So you can see that there's uh, limited RAM here and limited disk space, and it is one CPU. Um, whereas the larger ones here, let's say M1 Extra Large, is a 16 CPU machine, is available by default, um, and it comes with half a terabyte worth of storage space um, attached to it. Um, bigger ones are harder to place. So they were, from our perspective as, as resource providers, they're, they're more difficult. Smaller ones, much easier and often much quicker. So I will use this tiny one. Um, networks, default is good. It says classic. It's the only option available to me here. This is where those two options come in, security groups. I will be using a security group called SSH. Um, which allows me to connect to this thing using terminal software. Um, other, um, so you can, you can see there's a uh, an R Studio um, security group which has been set up for specific R Studio use, and there is a uh, a Jupiter one. Um, these are these I have set these up in my project, and you can uh, manually set them up for your project too. And then there's this key pair thing that I mentioned, and I've got two keys listed here, a service and a trial key. I'll use this top one here. Um, and it's important, if no key is provided, then in ordinary circumstances, you, you cannot access the machine. The, you don't, you, your administrator account in the, in the virtual machine will not have any one act, or being able to access it. So where there's a will, there's a way. Contact us for support, you know, if you've inadvertently find yourself in that situation. Um, but so the la I'm going to skip the last three tabs. They're um, non-compulsory. I'm going to hit launch. And um, <coughs> and keep my fingers crossed a little bit because there it is. Um, we've just released a new dashboard, and it's it's, it's nervously slow at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it see it, it gives you a few statuses here. Um, it's building the machine. It's already allocated me an IP address. You're familiar with IP addresses, I'm sure. Um, 
and that's an important piece of information that we'll use in a second to um, actually log on to this machine. So there's a spawning thing, um, which is always fun if you talk to ecologists. Um, oh, we're done. So we have we have a machine now. Um, so and the key thing here to take away here is that we we set it up with this US service key with this um, key pair, and it's been allocated this IP address. Um, so we now have a remote computer that is ours to use, ours to administer. We are the administrators in this machine, which is a key difference with a number of other remote um, computing options. You are the you're the administrator, so you've, you're in charge of how um, to set this machine up, what software to run it, what version of software to run it, and these are, in some circumstances, important considerations. Anyway, um, we'll, I'm copying this to my clipboard and I'm using my terminal software, um, which might come across a little bit um, 1970s to you. It does to me. Anyway, anyway, I'm going to use a command. Um, um, so I'm, I'm unaware of your your individual familiarities with this uh, with with these uh, te techniques and software that I use, um, but I will um, just demonstrate that we can now let this computer do something for us. Um, I'm going to SSH, that is, make a secure connection to um, that computer. I'm going to do that IP address. I am going to put an identity file in, and that is this file here actually. Um, savvy users may um, have their own thoughts about this. Oh, that didn't work. So I'm copying this onto my clipboard and then pasting it there. And there's one additional thing that I'll introduce here. That image that we chose called Ubuntu 18.04, that comes with a default user account. And that default user account has got administrator privileges and it's called Ubuntu. At. So I'm connecting to this remote machine using SSH using my key, the key that I applied in that launch um, dialog. And it's been given this IP address and I know that it has this default username. Please. How, how do you know the default username? Um, in the support documentation, there is um, there's reference to um, those and um, I'm using a Nectar official image. So you saw me use the Ubuntu 1804, it's called Nectar official Ubuntu 1804 and with another version number or something behind it. And I know from the from um, the image catalog, which is a web page that we maintain. Is this? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's okay. Ah. Um, that I can use Ubuntu for Ubuntu images. Debian images is another distribution of Linux um, use Debian and there are a few that use EC2 user and but so that's that's something that you'll need to um, learn a little bit about and it's embedded in the selection that I made, the selection of image that I made. So um, the first time you connect to a um, an SSH server, um, your SSH client should warn you like this, the authenticity cannot be verified. Um, that's just the first establish, establishment of this connectivity. I, I answer yes, because I trust this. I've just built this and it, it, you know, I've, I've, it, nothing is surprising here to me. Would this happen in you know, like half a year from now? I get this warning when um, when I thought, yeah, I launched this thing half a year ago, and uh, then then that's a red flag. So this is, in essence, a, a side effect of this red flag mechanism. So we won't worry much about it now, but it is something that always comes up, of course. So you can see um, I am now logged on. 
Um, it's very underwhelming. I appreciate that. But that little green thing halfway down the screen where it says Ubuntu at Acme Analysis, that is the key of what we've done so far. So I'm going to step back. Um, we've brought a computer called Acme Analysis into existence using this OpenStack Nectar stuff that we are logged on to. This dashboard gives us the, the power of bringing computers into existence. And we have then using the, um, the, um, um, the parameters that we've, we've been given, the IP address, we know the username, we know the key, we've been able to log on to this and this computer can now do stuff. It's a bare computer, bare Linux, so I can see there's disk free, there's a few disks available. Um, I have, um, um, I can, there's, there's nothing really installed on it. So I can, I can look at the processes that are running. It's, that, that's, it's all very underwhelming and not particularly interesting. Um, but we can make it do, we can now program bash up. It probably has Python on it. Does it have Python on it? Is it dash version? There we go. It's got a Python 2.7 included in this particular distribution. So this is very bare, the very bare minimum of what this demonstration really is about. We've launched a computer and we've logged on to a computer. We can now um, go in a number of directions if you want. So we can talk about um, we can talk about um, the, the administrative side. What does it take to get a project like this? But we can also already get a trial project, right? So if you really want to try, then you don't need an allocation or allocation requests. Um, but uh, you can you can just have a crack with this personal trial project. We can also launch something more interesting. For instance, I can throw this one away and we can um, set ourselves up on our studio or we can install an R studio server on here if if that is what um, you know what the, if that's the way you would su suspect you would use a resource like this. Um, um, we can uh, complete the life cycle we can throw it away which is an important thing. When I just mentioned that we've got a, a resilient and large pool of resources so you don't have to worry, um, worrying is what we do much too much of. And um, what we do often is we, worry, we, we want to get it right on the first time. Well, you don't have to get it right on the first time. Um, if you are you know, trying stuff, and you fail miserably on uh, you know, the end of day one. You've, you've learned a few interesting steps, which you've made note. You forgot whatever went wrong, but um, you throw it away and start again tomorrow. There's no recycling. There's no environmental impact. There's, there's, you know, there's very little to worry about. There's no cost. There's no dollars. You're not throwing away perfectly good materials. You know, you're putting the resources back in the pool and you start again tomorrow. You're doing the same thing. You start too small, you start a little bit bigger tomorrow. Um, so again, it brings down this barrier for us to try things. So um, I see many, many users out there just having a go. Now, there's a world open here and that world goes into um, wild areas of expertise and special specialities that you may not be interested in. Um, like there are users out here that have whole constellation of servers, resiliently organized uh, uh, data distribution around the world, or have built themselves clusters in the cloud, compute clusters in the cloud, which is uh, which is fantastic. There are um, sensor networks that are facilitated by this. These may all well be not really what we are. You know, there's not really a basic use case. These guys have software engineers and system administrators. As a researcher, you might be much more interested in a use case that is a little bit closer to what our laptop or desktop computer does for us. Um, so, but with the system administration capability and um, with the flexibility of scaling that out to 
um, you know, to reasonable size and perhaps with the ability to collaborate. So to bring on other researchers or other of your um, um, colleagues into the same machine where you can collaborate. So those are all sort of more um, goals that are within reach that are sort of easy, more easy to grasp and, and are within reach. And they're all possible with this resource. So um, I've been talking for about half an hour now. And I think the basic part of the story I've demonstrated. Um, so I'd, I'd like to sort of solicit um, what it is that might be interesting to look at. So, uh, have you guys got any question? Um, I was wondering, how do you bring collaborators? Do you just provide the IP address and then the person? Um, so this um, Acme analysis computer that we're looking at right now has got one user account. And that user account has both the um, benefit and the drawback of it being um, an administrator account. So I, I, I can um, use that to install software in that. Um, but it, I can use that account to do user management. So if you want to give someone the ability to be an administrator, then yes, you could add um, someone's user key pair to this account mm -hmm. and, um, and they, would use, they would work on the same account. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to um, want to give out non-privileged account, we'd have to create a new user. It's fairly, fairly simple, even though um, so Zudo makes me the administrator, then is it add user? I never know. Is it add user or is it user add? Um, I don't know. So so I've now made a user called used B. Um, And I can see that in the in the Unix standard or home directory, there is now a home directory for the user Ubuntu, and there is a home directory for the user USB. And um, there is a particular um, file that will uh, that's called the public key that will need to um, put on the right place in that user account for that user to, to get access. So um, again because this computer lives exposed to um, to the full gamut of the internet, um, we take security, um, you know, we, we make it fairly simple, but we, we, we have a few um, s simple decisions. And one of them is we do not like or allow by default password based um, SSH connectivity. So this terminal connection here, um, it's by default set up to use key pair security. So that's one of the literacies. Key yeah. pair literacy is one of the things that we do rely on in this world. Um, by the time you get the hang of it, um, it makes your life so much easier. Um, but it, it is something that um, a lot of people are not exposed to and will have to learn um, that step along the way. I had to... Um change my permissions on the key it wouldn't let me log in because it was yeah okay like key, key files are a, a bit a bit particular yeah. um depending on what um, client system you're on and they should be only read write yeah. for the so i had to change it user. to log in yep. yeah so there is um there's a lot of help like this available in the community and that community includes you know the professional helpers at nectar of which i'm one um, so we've got a uh, help desk. I'll jump back to the slides in a minute, and there's a couple of couple more little remarks that I'll uh, I'll mention. Um, so there are ways of um, of like your question just then uh, of sharing and collaborating on this particular machine. I don't think that this demonstration sort of shows it well enough. Um, but help is not far away, um, email based or web based, um, or climbing the phone, there's a phone number. Um, yeah, so if no one else has a question, I have a question. Maybe you could talk about the different storage options. 
and I guess some people might want to have like a virtual machine that then can access some data, let's say store at TPAC or at NCI, in the case of a lot of our user. Um, Storage is a uh, is a cesspool of different options. All of them are confusing, um, and most of no, and, and and many of them are possible, but not all of them. Um, in this cloud context, um, there is a. And well, we, we've been talking about virtual machines. We have the equivalent, we have a virtual USB drive in this area, which may well be the most um, straightforward way of, of looking at uh, an option that we call volume storage. It's the virtual U USB drive. We can have a look at that and how that works in the life cycle. Um, if we, you know, um, that'll, that'll take us 10 or so minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, then there is collection storage, which is very institution um, related. So here at TPAC, we have uh, a, a number of systems that host um, host uh, large collections, large number of collections of research data, and they, on request, they can be made available to. Um, virtual machines like the one that we just launched. So they are two um, fairly different um, use cases for data storage. Um, they do come with different scales. Um, maybe that's not so relevant. By the time you're consuming, like I'm implying here, a large collection that is um, held by some held and governing, you know, and, and curated by someone else, then you're really only consuming that data. Um, there is, of course, another like, world of data out there. By the time you've got the commands and the software um, installed on your machine to to, um, to uh, get to web-based data, the web-based data is there for you to consume. Um, and there are specialist services that can do this. And if you, if we, we looked at Python here. Um, I am a NAR Studio user. Um, part of the time um, or an R user. So um, I have my skills and my packages available to, um, to consume data using, you know, specifically R um, or R specific mechanisms. We can have, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that we want to have a look at that. Would you, would you suggest I um, launch and, and um, look into a volume store? Use case? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, just making a difference between ephemeral and what's. Okay. If I, if I look at um, the disk free command here, and um, there's a few um, funny little things that, um, that it shows, but the, the key one over here is our device VDA1. That's a disk. It's a disk device. Um, it comes across a little bit as, uh, as code to you, but it is where it is. Um, you, you can access it using that using that encoding there. So I can show you that over there live a whole heap of um, directories. So um, some of the flavors that um, that Nectar provide um, provide two drives, one VDA. That's where the system lives. That's where the operating system lives, and that's where Linux knows a few default settings and everything. That's also where the default user, the home directory, goes, um, which is not always a good idea. But that's another story again. And it gives us an ephemeral drive. An ephemeral. What does that mean when? Um, when we're talking about disks. Um, in our virtual machine life cycle, which if we launch it and then we use it, and then maybe for a little while we don't use it and turn it off, and then a little while later we turn it on again and use it again, and then at the end of it, yeah, we're done with it, we terminate it. No recycling, just terminate, delete. 
and um, that is sort of the ordinary life cycle of a um, of a virtual machine. An ephemeral drive is a drive that lives and dies with that life cycle. So um, when we launch it, it when we launch a a virtual machine that has an ephemeral drive in it, then it, you don't have influence on the size of it. We just give it to you at a particular size, and but when you turn it off, you know you can't access it because it's attached to that machine. Um, when you turn it back on, you can access it again. Data was preserved. There's there's no um, weirdness there. But the moment you you delete the machine the ephemeral drive is deleted too. So you need to make sure that you've done, if you've used that drive, that you've done your data management before you delete the machine, because delete is um, irrevocable. You cannot turn that back. Um, so there's another little life cycle element to virtual machines called snapshotting. Ephemeral drive, not snapshotted. Um, but that's, that's the ephemeral drive why have we called this ephemeral this is a, like an ephemeral river in a dry country you know it's it's not always hard. i don't really know why we've called it ephemeral but it contrasts with persistent drives and persistent drives you can request and attach i can i can show you maybe maybe that's the best way to go if i go to um back to the dashboard here, you see there's our Acme analysis machine. Um, on the left hand side, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've got this compute and instances thing. It's scrambling a little bit. I hope it all stays visible for you. Sing out if it is hard to read. Um, so over here, I'm going to go to volumes. I used that word before, volume storage, right? So I'll click volumes and volume there. And what I'm really now doing, I'm running to Harvey Norman again, and I am going to buy myself a virtual USB drive. I'm going here to create volume. You're going to run into a red light on the way to Harvey Norman. So Acme data, I won't give it a description, but um, you you want to, um, of course, do much better than I do um, when you're doing things for real. Um, here's a constraint, funny constraint. You want your data to live where your virtual machine lives. Or conversely, if you've got data somewhere, you want your virtual machines to live there because networking inside a data center is vastly vastly more performant than networking across even our nets network, the university's networks, right? So um, I'm going to spin it up over here in Tasmania. You heard me use the word spinning up, um, a very popular way of saying launching. Create volume. Very similar, right? A little wizard, a couple of little parameters. In just, this is a smaller one, of course, because there's nothing much to it. I gave it a size. I think I gave it 100 gigabyte. Is that right? Yes, I did. So that's it. That's it. Beat that, Harvey. Um, <coughs> I am going to now manage attachments. So I've got my virtual USB drive, but it's not connected to a computer. So I'm going to manage attachments. I'm going to plug my USB drive in into this Acme analysis um, instance attach volume this is it plugging in a usb drive it's 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 a perfect metaphor um for this particular um thing and as a matter of fact the unix machine that's still running in the background right i just flicked away from my terminal so that unix machine is still visible over there i'll wait until this attaching is done and you can see that it's now attached to dev vdb um on Acme analysis. So it's dev, that's the Unix word for device, and VDB is, well, I don't know, we can backronym it, virtual drive, virtual device B. 
Um, as opposed to A, remember that we already had A, that's our system drive? It, had, it said A1, but you know, that's a, let me show you now. I'm rerunning that DF command and you should, we should, we should see something much more impressive than this. I think this is uh, this is just failed us. Uh... No, it is not. It has not failed us. Your operator is failing you. I'm sorry about this. Um, so the df command only shows drives that have already been announced to Unix as mounted and everything. Um, the device wasn't, um, was, it has, we haven't done anything yet. Um, we need to do a once off action of mounting it and we need to do a once off action of formatting it. Um, which I haven't done yet. This LSB okay, this is list devices by link, um, shows um, VDB is indeed already um, available there. So um, we can go into how do you mount a device like this and then put it into a mount point, which means you can access it using LS and you can write files on it and set permissions on files and folders and that, um, which, which will be important for you to, to do when you've got this um, available to you. It's also fairly easy to get support if you're looking for it or documentation on uh, on the web to find out how to do that. Um, it will take me a few uh, minutes to get to this. It might not be the most relevant thing you want to answer. It. You can see that here VDB is, um, is attached and um, I can unattach it. Which again with this parallel USB drive, um, uh, this USB drive parallel in mind um, means that I can, if I had another virtual machine, I could plug it into the other one. So if I have data on my virtual USB drive in my project, then that can, uh, if say for I can take a start a bigger machine or a machine that's got another constellation of software on it for me to do a step of work. Um, then um, re re plugging it into a, a another another virtual machine, another instance is relevant. So um, we should find if this has succeeded. I haven't kept an eye on the screen. We should find VDB has now disappeared. So it's only VDA. So only that system disk that is. Uh, you can't remove that. It crippled the system if you could, um, so that you can't. Um, you can you can also not remove ephemeral drives, um, the ones that come with the life cycle of the virtual machine in some flavors. You can't remove them. Now, um, I said I would flick back to the slides. Um, this, so I'll do that um, now. Um, I will also show you um, a few um, examples of cloud-based computing. And this is designed to be even more underwhelming than what we've seen so far. Um, so you can see in my taskbar, um, a keen eye spots three R studios. Um, over here on the left is an R studio that is installed on my desktop. But towards the right, there is an R studio um, server. Um, that I've got access to. It's GEM48. It's a project that I'm a part of and it is an RStudio server that runs in the cloud just like the instances that we launched just then. Um, and it is a, um, a custom machine for one of our professors here in, um, in Global Ecology. And, um, and this is a, a large machine. It's 40, 48 CPUs, so they've got a custom arrangement and um, should be parallel, right? 48 CPUs. You wouldn't 
you wouldn't know that, right? This is how integrated cloud computing can be for you. So this is a, an R Studio. This is the R Studio um, proper on the desktop. Um, which I'm flicking between one and two now. Um, it can be that integrated. If if you think, oh yeah, but you know, here's this professional and with this professor in mind, if we set up an environment. Yes, I did. I did spend a little, little bit of time um, doing this and it is um, part of my day job to um, know this stuff. Um, but it is, I guess, an, an, a way of viewing this cloud computing thing. It's not something far-fetched that uses terminals. It can be this level of integrated. And I'll give you another commercial example that right there in between our studios um, is um, our, there's a Google Doc that uh, underwhelming, I, I warned you, it's a Google Doc, but it is in the cloud. It's out there and it's it's okay google has set this up for you with uh, you know, google um, g suite or whatever it is that you subscribe to or not um, in mind so there's a couple of those there and here's another um, piece of software jira is what in tpac we organize ourselves with again as examples of um, completely transparent cloud compute use um, you wouldn't know that it was remote, um, but it is, and you can have resources that give you the opportunity for this level of um, remote computing and this level of comfortable remote computing too. So that's one thing that I wanted to show. I'll quickly jump back to my slides if I can find them, there they are. So that's a very, um, quick demo. I give um, workshops that um, range from, um, let's say, four hours a day to bring groups of people um, across this stuff that will go into the key thing, that will go into the security group thing. It will do a few launch cycles with a few different images in mind, um, and it shows a few things about um, the storage and the data transfer is an important thing that we really didn't touch on here. Um, so those are workshops that we occasionally give your institutions when you're elsewhere will have very similar um, training arrangements i'm not, i'm sure um so i'll jump back to the notion of access and accounts nectar research cloud is available to any australian researcher i should really reword that to any researcher that is a member of an australian research institution because we've course got a lot of international collaborators that work as associates to or in our institutions that are equally eligible. It is by AAF membership. AAF we, we talked about this is delegation or um, organization for identities and resources are allocated by these allocation requests except with the exception of um, the personal trials that we talked about. Um, that's its location there. That is where the dashboard.rc.nectar.org.au, that is where we ran our launching demo. Um, support, um, we have got national support that is distributed over these eight or so nodes that are the data centers where this stuff lives. Um, and um, you can go to support.ehelp.edu or support uh, at ehelp.edu um, for uh, and at, on that website there will be one i think there's a 1300 number you can phone us um, if you prefer to speak to someone so those are the nectar specific support things so here's my little enigmatic um, blurb just to close off there are different options for your computing needs and they come with different characteristics and learning about one will make you realize what you're missing out on if you would have uh, chosen any of the others so learn
So any questions, please feel free to um, 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 ask now if there's time, if we've got time left, um, or uh, contact us, contact me, you can contact me in, I can get Paula perhaps to um, send a link to this, this slide if you want to um, refresh your memory on the story that we told, the demonstration is not really well covered in it. Um, but other than that, this was a little taster on what Nectar can offer in the area of remote computing. So thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Used? Yeah. Um, yeah, <clears throat> you gave that example of 48 CPUs um, for the uh, RStudio backend server. Um, and I got the impression that, that you think that is on the large side for a Nectar. Uh, request. Would that be Yeah, correct? that is uh, that's correct. So the flavors that we um, that we that I showed in that launch dialogue, um, by default they range from one CPU to um, sixteen CPUs. Um, that's the default range of um, flavors in the Nectar Cloud. If you want custom flavors, they are possible. Um, it will require you to get in touch with the specifically the node that is supplying your um, your <coughs> space, your allocation space, and um, in some circumstances they can provide custom flavors, and this is what we did for this particular um, research group. Um, Forty-eight CPU in the Nectar context is uh, uh, significant. Um, I, I think um, because um, we have, uh, as I showed in very early slide, we have on the large scale end of, you know, of the Nectar boundary, we have um, HPC computing. So we, if, if you really need it larger scale, then there's a chance that HPC is a more suitable option for you. That said, I don't really know what other nodes are up to in terms of provisioning um, larger, so large um, CPU count um, instances. I know there are uh, large memory instances, so there's, uh, uh, there's um, nodes that provision custom flavors that have more RAM per CPU, for instance. And there is, uh, we have a number of GPUs. If your research or your computations rely on uh, um, graphical processing, so lots of AI um, applications rely on uh, graphical processing units, so GPUs, um, that can be hosted in uh, in this Nectar context as well. But they tend to come with um, these custom flavors. So that's another sort of customization option that you'll have to discuss with your local node representatives. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. Right, that's all. It's two o'clock as well. So thanks, Hughes. You're quite welcome. Well, you, it's got recorded, so. <laughs> all right, yep. <laughs> we might get more lucky and in any case advertise with around. I'm sure there's more people that is interested. Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.